boom, 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 Well, hello and welcome back. What's going on, Adam? Oh, not too much, Brooke. I am uh, enjoying the uh, soupy weather of Minnesota. We have fog and rain and snow all at once, and it, it's it's fun. So uh, I would like it to be April at some point soon, but until it is, I'm going to pretend that I enjoy this. How about you? <laughs> it is um, extremely rainy. Well, I shouldn't say rainy. It's extremely windy. Like as I was driving home, like. I felt physical pressure like slowing my vehicle down because the wind was <laughs> blowing so hard. Um, I've never been in a place where wind advisories were so prevalent. So well, it freaks I mean, me a lot, out a little. You got the whole prairie and nothing to stop it. So, I mean, you know, that yeah. wind gets up a good head steam going. Oh yeah, it, it builds up some pretty good steam. Uh, before we jump into it, this just came down. Like uh -oh. just came down that the Senate has confirmed uh, Katanji Brown Jackson to be the first black female to sit on the Supreme Court. And I was surprised it was like 53, 47, because I figured it would be like 50, 50 with, you know, the vice president being the, the, the deciding vote. But mm -hmm. still, how disappointing it is, is it that 47 people saw those that confirmation hearing and didn't think this person was qualified. That's uh, a little bit concerning like Lindsey Graham, who, who like basically sang her praises and could not find anything wrong with her, but then said, I'm voting now. Yeah, it's just, what? It just vote, along, vote along the lines, I guess, you know? So uh, it, it, it's history making. It's paving mm -hmm. her way to become the first uh, Black female in the highest court. So it's exciting. And like, of course, we'll keep, Keep watching because it still has a little bit to go um and it's interesting that like it feels like our last couple confirmation hearings it was because someone had passed away or 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 they were stepping immediately whereas uh katani brown won't be on the court officially until the end of the summer because uh briar still has to finish out his term so that right. feels a little different from the last couple right but yes, like you said, she'll be sworn in after he retires uh, sometime this summer. So who knows? You know, he'll be like, he might be like, ah, you know, come June, he might be like, ah, and then it might be like, oh, I think I'll stick around till August. You know, it depends on uh, what they're trying to get done, I guess. But it is making history. It's, it's history making. It's exciting. I'm like so happy to be able to see this. So. And if you if you hear a strange howling in the background, evidently there's a siren going off in St. Paul right now. Oh, I don't know what it's for. Siren? Uh, it's I mean, usually they do this on the first Wednesday of the month. So I guess it's probably the first Wednesday of the month, but usually they do it at 1 p.m. So we should be clear, but well, today's very, Thursday. So, today's Thursday. So yeah, record there's no, on Wednesday. So I have no idea what's going on. Uh, I'm sure it's fine though. All right. Um, might be severe weather. You might want to Google that real quick. Yeah, Make yeah. sure you know uh, nothing There's is happening. No, nothing on nothing on the apps. Maybe they're, just, they're probably probably just testing the horn to make sure it works. My mm -hmm. dog is sleeping through it, so clearly it can't be that bad. <laughs> um, have you watched anything good this week? Uh, I watched the the new episode of Moon Knight because we are recording this on Thursday. So I actually got Ooh, to yeah, watch, I gotta it. watch it um, tonight. Oh, it's like one of the things that I was worried about with a couple of the other earlier series is it felt like it took them a while to get into it. Mm -hmm. And then there was so much to wrap up at the end, mm -hmm. especially like the, the Loki series or um, the Winter Soldier, where by the end, you're like, we got like two episodes. They got to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, this one is moving faster. That's exciting. Because that means I feel like there's going to be more time to really like they've already kind of set the scene and like okay we know who the players are this is what's going to happen mm -hmm. uh and that was an exciting part of the second episode but it's it's already uh very very interesting just because it's a very different style yeah uh, and what oscar isaacs is doing having to create so far two completely different characters and often argue with himself through mirrors like i think disney does 
themselves a disservice by putting like one division in February, March, April of last year and this in February, March, April, because by the time the Emmys are all around, it's been nine months and people forget Mm -hmm. because this, if this continues, it is an incredible performance. And there's likely, if they follow anything from the comic books, the Moon Knight character actually had three separate personalities. So oh. it's likely that it, maybe not this season or maybe it'll be next season, but there's a third personality to come uh, th- that is part of, you know, all inhabits the same body. So it, it's really cool. Oscar Isaacs does not get enough credit. Like everybody likes him, but like he's in all these blockbuster movies, but he's a really good actor. He really is. Like you're right. I, mean, he, I don't it, think I he guess he did like credit. the, like the scenes, would you do scenes for marriage? Was that him? Yes. Yes. So, I mean, he, he's done some dramatic stuff like that, but I think people forget because he, he's got the movie star good looks and he's been in, he's been in Star Wars. He's been in the, now he's in the Marvel universe. He was in an X-Men movie way back when, uh, but he's a really talented guy. So I'm, I'm excited to see where this uh, series goes. And I hope, I really hope that they, that the character of Moon Knight is not going to be one that they keep on the fringes. I hope that it makes, you know, he makes his way into especially with like blade coming and you know uh the black knight and some of the darker mystical like way that the trend that they're going towards Mm -hmm. uh he seems like like he would be like they almost are building like a like a dark hunters or like a dark mystic avengers with like black knight and blade and and even like scarlet witch to an extent and so it's it's hopefully he'll be more than just you know on the fringes Yes, I I I uh I haven't seen the second episode. I saw the first one. Uh I watched that one of course when it came out last week. So I am excited to catch up tonight and see what happens. And Ethan Hawke also killing it, which when you're expecting to see the guy from Singles, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a shock. So he looks very different. Like he does you almost he's old don't now. recognize it's, him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean he does not look like and, and it's very much the character where he's supposed to kind of be this, you know, almost monk, like just very all natural, very, you know, like wearing like almost sackcloth robes all the time. Uh, no, like very little like makeup. His hair looks just super natural and, and like he's just there to have hair. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, he's also doing a really good job. So it's it's a lot of I'm very excited about it. I hope it continues. Then I've also just been rewatching like White Collar because um my comfort show so i'm yeah i like my third rewatch of that in the last year or so well i um so there's this icelandic show that i think i talked about last year when i had watched it um and it was a couple of seasons it was um it was only one season, but it was like from 2018 or 2019. I think it came out like right before the pandemic. And wow. now a new season has come out. It's called Beforeigners. It's an Icelandic Norwegian show. Um, and it's like people from different time periods pop up in modern day time. Oh, wow. And, you kind, and they're kind of adjusting, but it's a police crime procedural so not only do you have all these people from these different time periods, you also have crime and murders that are being solved. Because yeah, you know, they're like, well, is this was this the time traveler people or not? Yeah, and so you've got like, as they call them, a contemporary working with a a uh, time immigrant. Uh, they both are police officers on the same force. You know, is, is this on crimes. Netflix or no? This is an HBO. Oh, HBO Max. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which I do have, so if I so it comes to find out. So I'm very excited. I just, you know, it's a, of course, it's European, so the seasons are quite a bit shorter. There's only six episodes. Um, I did confirm that there will be a third season. So excited yes. about that. Uh, Netflix just started a new reality dating show. It's from the creators of. Um, Love is Blind, and it also okay. has Nick and Vanessa Lachey as the hosts. And it's called <laughs> The Ultimatum, Marry or Not. <laughs> is it like a, just a, like a father with a shotgun in every scene? or No, so basically it's several couples that one of the couple has decided, hey, look, 
we're either going to get oh. married or we walk away but they put a, of course like a, a twist on it so what they do is all these couples end up in like this apartment complex or something and so uh the day they arrive everybody is with their couple and then for like a couple they they, they technically br- break them up and they date around for a couple of days and then at the end of the week they have to pick a new partner that they will live with as if married for three weeks and then they will go back to their original partner for three weeks and decide hey do i really want to marry the person that i came with do we want to separate or do i see myself with this new person it's like sort of like a temptation island but happening in a bubble yes with probably less people by the pool just being mostly naked. No pools or nudity just yet, but lots of wine. So uh, lots, yeah, I mean, well, that's 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 the one thing the producers of Love, Love, Love is Blind were thinking about. Like, well, we got to bring the wine. Yeah, bring, we're bringing that over. And the funny thing about it is, because um, someone asked me, they were like, "Why do they do those cups? Like, you can't see." And it was like because then you can't see how much they've drank. So if they have to edit things. Yeah, yeah. Makes, see, that's that's like the behind the the scenes stuff that most people don't think about. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but when you're when you're in the industry, like somebody like you, you get. <laughs> I'm in the industry. <laughs> I don't know how many people have been whose voices have been on Amazon Prime. You can raise your hand. <laughs> I know it sounds like the industry to me. I don't know. <laughs> oh man, but I think. Um... Is that all? I was going to make a list of like all the things I've been watching. I need to start the girl from Plainville. And that's yeah. based on the true story of the girl that like basically forced her boyfriend to, yeah, to commit suicide. Like, and it was, it was the first like legal case where someone was charged with, is it manslaughter or even like murder via text? I think it was murder. I could be wrong, yeah. but I do think it was murder because that was like the huge thing. It was like, yeah, it's a huge legal precedent. Yeah, but good because what she did was, uh, un- it was disgusting. Yeah, I-, I keep seeing it. Like, it's one of those that, you know me, I have to like monitor what I'm allowed, my brain is allowed to intake because otherwise it's going to come like roaring back, which is hilarious because I watched Moon Knight with like scary Egyptian gods like chasing people down hallways and that never pops up in my dreams. Yeah, really. Which, why doesn't that, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's because it's a it's comic book so I know it's not real. But like sometimes like, man, that looks really intense and I'm not sure that like Adam's uh, brain chemicals can handle it. <laughs> well, you're going to hate the B-side today. I know it was a perfect segue, right? Here we go. Let's, it really was. It really was. Let's 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 mess with some chemicals. That's all right. I got new five thousand milligram vitamin D pills. So <laughs> I was like, who needs the sun? I'll just hey, ingest it. Where'd you get five thousand milligrams? I was told I need vitamin D. Would you go to Walmart? No, uh, there's a little like l- literally across the street from me is a pharmacy, and be- in my building there's this new clinic, and I finally bit the bullet and got a physical for the first time in a few years because I don't like going to the doctor because it's like when you take a car in you know that the car's running fine mm-hmm. but it's probably got some stuff wrong with it that's how, how I feel when I like, go in for a physical <laughs> like they're going to be like ah you need like new fan belts uh your radiator's in trouble uh, you're, prob- you're probably you're probably going to need a new transmission within three to five years <laughs> but it turned out okay this time but they were like hey here's this new prescription we recommend so I went across the street at the pharmacy and to take the oil change, you know, metaphor further, there was this nice lady at the counter who I went in for one prescription, which cost me four ninety five, and I left with a bag of stuff. <laughs> she's like, "Oh, you should try this and this, and this works really well with this." And I'm like, "Okay, I'm gonna need one of those pill boxes now." <laughs> You're gonna have to have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah. Friday, and it's and it's all like supplements and vitamins, and I don't know. I, f- I feel slightly better, but it could be placebo. <laughs> but yeah, I'll take a picture of the box and I'll send it to you. But I, after taking uh, a pill for two days in a row, I've read the box. It's like, don't take, this is not meant to be taken every day. So we need to pack off. Uh, I'm so happy that you read that beforehand. Not, you yeah. Know. Well, I mean, I'm two days in, so I'm like, oh. Okay, I'm gonna have this is more of a once a week thing. I see. Okay, <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm such a good mood today. I've got like all the vitamin C. 
Oh like, why does gosh. Adam look so tan? Oh, because he stood on the surface of the sun with a pill. It's great. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So are you ready for the visa? I, I am ready. I got my vitamin D. Let's do this. All right, Adam. So like I said, it is not going to make you happy uh, <laughs> this week's episode. So this is the case of the murderer gone free on the technicality. I didn't mean for that to rhyme either. I know, but that's, again, when you're in the industry, you're just that good. It happens. All right. So this is the story of Issy Sagawa. So Issy Sagawa was born on April 26th of 1949 in Kobe Hayago Prefecture in Japan. So Issy's parents were pretty wealthy. His father, Akira, was a businessman who had served as president of Curita Water Industries, and his grandfather had been an editor for the Asai Shibun newspaper. Okay. Issy was born prematurely, which I completely understand because I was a preemie baby myself, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit different in 1949 than it is today. Yes, yes. Um, he was he was born so small that he fit in the palm of his. How father. small was he? I'm sorry. <laughs> he, he fit in the palm of his father's hands, which can I just tell you? I had to wear doll clothes, so I'm just saying. Anyway, uh, it's hey, not my, it's my not youngest was just, my youngest was smaller than a Mountain Dew bottle when he was born. Yes, I remember. At that that point in my life is what I used for size comparisons for everything. <laughs> so he was like I said, he was born prematurely. And he developed enteritis, which is a disease of the small intestine, and doctors did not expect him to survive at all. Oh. Is he eventually recovers and he grows? He has to get several injections of potassium and calcium in saline. Okay. Like a lot of preemies, he, he kind of remains small, not all, but you know, a lot, sometimes preemies tend to, to remain on the smaller side and mm-hmm. Uh, his, that his growth time in the womb is very important. Mm-hmm. So his small stature, his uh, fragile health, and his he had an inverted personality due to all of that. So it led him to develop a strong interest in literature. Okay. Issy attended schools in Kamakara, Kanagawa Prefecture. He was actually, it was there that he experienced his first cannibalistic desires Um, Some reports say he was in the first grade. Some reports say he was in the third grade. What they can all agree on is that he saw a male uh, peer's thigh and thought it looked delicious. Yeah, those were his words. He thought it looked delicious. He even recalled a, quote, fond memory of his uncle dressing as as a monster, like in a monster costume, and putting Mm. him and his younger brother in a stew pot, like pretending to like, yeah. you know, he I'm going to cook you, ha ha Right, which, you know, a normal kid would be like, ha 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 he took this to a different level. Like, that's a great idea. Right, oh, cooking people, yeah, uncle. So he actually often sought uh, fairy tales that involved humans being eaten, i.e. Hansel and Gretel. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the, the, uh, there's a Russian which oh yeah and she bakes them into pies but that was yes that? yeah that wasn't okay. hansel and gretel no it's she could they call her by a different name though it's not the baba yaga baba yaga yes that's it thank you the baba yaga yes thank you ant man and the wasp which is i looked as i was searching around the room looking for inspiration i saw the the cover of the dvd and i was like oh yeah baba yaga they talk about that in ant man and the wasp yes that's it baba yaga all right so in a, an interview with Vice Magazine in 2011, Issy reported that when he was younger, he, he also participated in bestiality and he had cannibalistic desires for women. So Issy goes to school, he graduates, and then he attends Waco University where he gets a master's degree in English literature at Kwansi uh, Gakwan University. So at the age of 24, while attending Waco University in Tokyo, Issy follows a tall German woman home. 
So remember, he has cannibalistic desires. Yeah, yeah this is already an uh-oh moment. He follows her home. He breaks into her apartment while she is asleep because his intention was to cannibalize her, not kill her, but to cannibalize her. He wanted to slice off part of her, her, her butt and sneak away with it. But she woke up before he was able to do anything. Like he's in the midst of about to attack her. She wakes up. She, he, she pushes him away. Yeah. And he flees. He's eventually captured by police and charged with attempted rape. He did not tell the police what his real intentions were. Just not shocking. It wasn't like, oh, guys, no, no, no. I wasn't there to rape her. I just wanted to cut a little of the rump roast off. <laughs> right. And take that home. I was, just, I did, the butcher was not available. Uh, it was, you know, that's, that was my goal. He was like, that cake was looking good. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. That was, that's terrible. We're, we're, we're the worst. Um, okay, of course, we're, we're not making fun of you gotta have some humor and things yeah, this like is how we, yeah this is how we deal with like psych, psychos we have to find right. some way to laugh at it because this is like already i know this is not going to go to a good place when we start out where the <laughs> guy yeah 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 so we're, we're, we're going down a long road now remember his father is very wealthy so he was able to get the charges dropped And his father paid a victim, the victim, a settlement. Like, and and it's a little messed up that like, it shouldn't be different, but like, I feel like if he had mentioned that he was going to cannibalize her, people would have been like, okay, we're not just going to like, we're going to charge you for sure. Cause that's messed up. Whereas, oh, oh, you're going to rape, you're going to rape her or whatever. Like, 100%, you're right. You're right. It should be, oh, you were going to rape her. No, you, you got to go under the prison. Yeah. But you were going to commit crime. And stop. You we don't just let you go. Yeah. Yeah. So in 1977, Issy moves to France. He's 27 years old and he moves to France to pursue a PhD in literature at the Sorbonne in, in Paris. Well, while he's in Paris, he says that almost every night he would bring a prostitute home and try to shoot them. But he says, for whatever reason, my fingers froze up and I couldn't pull the trigger. Because you weren't totally convinced to be a monster yet. No, it I took guess. about it took about four years. So on June eleventh of nineteen eighty one, he's now thirty two years old, still at the Sarbonne. He invites his classmate Renee Hartevelt over. Renee happened to be a Dutch woman that was also in Paris studying literature. Mm-hmm. So he invites her over under the pretext of translating poetry for a school assignment. Right. His real Classic. plan, right. The old bait and switch was he was really going to kill her and eat her. But she was probably worried this is like going to be Netflix and chill. He, exactly, right? He picked her because she was healthy and beautiful characteristics that he felt he didn't have. He considered himself like small, he was four foot, about four foot nine. He considered himself ugly and weak. So he was, he was using the whole, you are what you eat. So exactly. Not. He wanted to like absorb her energy. Right. Like no lie. I just watched totally by accident district nine. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was kind of like the, the same premise. These people were like trying to like eat the aliens because they wanted to like absorb their powers or whatever. Yeah. It, it yeah. doesn't really work like that, folks. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't, but sometimes you take 500 milligrams of something because you think it'll make you feel better. <laughs> a little bit different, a little bit different. That's uh, a small step. <laughs> so Renee was 25 years old. She's five foot 10. And like I said, she's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. So she like is pretty much the exact opposite of what he feels like he is. So she gets to his house and she's reading poetry at a desk and she has her back to him when he shoots her in the neck with a rifle now this was his second attempt the first attempt was the night before and the gun jams Mm -hmm. wow and she's just like oh what are you doing with a rifle over there oh just you know cleaning it if it it jams she might not have even heard it 
you know she's just in there in her own mind you know in her own world reading and she might not have even heard it (sighs) so he he shoots her in the neck almost like a comedy well wait wait if you think that's a comedy he passes out at the shock of shooting her he faints after he shoots her he faints then he wakes up and he's like oh wait i've got to eat this woman now before Issy decides to, you know, consume her, first mm-hmm. he has sex with her. Oh, great. So maybe the first time the, the rape part was part of it. Uh, maybe. Yeah. So he tries to bite into her, but again, frail health. His teeth aren't sharp enough, which is kind of like morbid to think that the average human's teeth are sharp enough to bite through skin, but they technically are. Yeah, it's so he leaves his apartment and he goes and buys a butcher knife. Once he has the butcher knife, he begins to consume various parts of her body, eating most of her breasts and her face. He either ate them raw sushi style or he would cook them. He then put other parts of her body in the refrigerator. He also took photographs of her body at each of the stages. I am not going to post those on our website because... Um, oh, they're, they're out there? Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Sorry. They're, they're, they're pretty horrific. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, after a few days, her decomposing body starts to smell, as, you know, bodies tend to do. So he attempts to dump her remains in the lake at the uh, Bois de Blown. I think I said that right. I wrote down the phonetic spelling of this, the Bois de Blown. So he's carrying her body in two suitcases, but he gets caught in the act. Onlookers that were eating at a nearby restaurant, they saw him and he ran. So he's captured by French police four days later. And also like, it's weird to take luggage into the woods yeah yeah like i feel like that's just like one of those things like that person is very lost (laughs) he described her body as her decomposing body he described it as the bothersome body and this second attempt or this attempt where he you know takes her body and he he dumps it was actually the second attempt it seems like stuff is always the second attempt with him the, yeah, this guy, and he's got stick to itiveness, I guess. So, like, this is the second woman he tries because he tried second to, time, he, yeah, the second, second time, time he, he had he, to shoot her, right? And so, the second time he had to dump her body. So, the first attempt, he tried to get a taxi where he was going to take her body to a dump site, but there were um, too many witnesses. And also, wouldn't the taxi guy be a witness? Oh, do you remember taking this guy to the wilderness with his luggage? Right? Oh, yeah, Did, was that weird? Does that happen a lot? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, like I said, he drops her. He runs. Police obviously find him because, you know, there's witnesses. They're like, hey, that guy left his luggage. Right. Hey, you are not going on a trip here, are you? You dropped this. So he's arrested. And, of course, police get a warrant. They search his house. And they find even more evidence in his home like mm. body parts in the fridge. Yeah, because yeah, mm-hmm. he saved some. Yeah. Again, his wealthy father provides him a defense lawyer. He was held for two years awaiting a trial. Wow. And while he was held, he had to be, he had to be criminally, or excuse me, he had to be psychologically examined, examined to see if he was fit and sane to stand trial. He was found legally insane and unfit to stand trial by a French judge. That French judge was Jean-Louis Bruguier, who ordered him to be held indefinitely in a mental institution. Sounds like the right answer to me. Different countries, different rules. But... I'm, hey, he's off the streets. Hold him somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, here you'd have that whole like due process thing or something. Yeah. I'm not but, a lawyer, but no, they said hold him indefinitely. There, he gets a visit while he's in this mental institution by an author, uh, Enuhiko Yamoda. And the, together, the two of them basically write a book called In the Fog, 
which is an account of this murder. Of course, there's going to be publicity surrounding this, and he kind of becomes like a celebrity. Yeah. The French authorities decide to deport him to Japan, where he's immediately committed to the Matsuwaza Hospital in Tokyo. Good call. Well, while he's there, he gets examined, and they find him sane. Oh. They just said it was a sexual perversion that was the sole motivation for his murder. Well, because he's no longer in France and he's been extradited to Japan, the charges in France were dropped. The French documents, the French court documents were sealed. They weren't sent to Japanese authorities. Well, now there's no case in France. Way to go. So basically he can't legally be detained in Japan. He checks himself out of the mental hospital on August 12th of 1986 and has remained free since that day. So 86, so we're going on 30, what, 35 years, 36 Mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And he's never gotten in trouble again. He has not, but he, so we'll talk about it. He has made a living off of talking about this murder. So between 1986 and 1997, Issy Sagawa was frequently invited to be a guest speaker and com- uh, commentator. In 1992, he appeared on Hisayasu's Sato's exploitation film called Unfaithful Wife, Shameful Torture. That's the English translation. He has written about 20 books about the murder that he committed, of course, including uh, In the Fog, his most, the one that helped him to get released. Um, his most recent book, Extremely Intimate Fantasies of Beautiful Girls, is a book of drawings of women that have been made by himself and other famous artists. Uh, so he's a famous artist now, too. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's also a book about that he has contributed to on the 1997 Kobe Child murders. So this is where it kind of gets comedic again. He's w- written restaurant reviews for the Japanese magazine Spa. Oh no. It was always just like, doesn't taste like person. Right. I, it doesn't this, taste this, like This stuff. restaurant it's, is great. Yeah. This breast meat doesn't taste like human breast meat. So I give it a, what? No, I don't. Like why mm-hmm. would you, I don't want that guy's opinion. Exactly. Well, because of his notoriety, and he has, of course, admitted to this murder and written several books about it, um, he can't find, now he's finding it hard to, because I guess publishers now have a conscience, um, he can no longer find publishers for his writings, and he has struggled to find employment. He was nearly accepted to a French language school because the manager was impressed by his courage to use his real name, like when he applied and just being at the school but employees protested and of course then he was rejected yeah i don't know i don't know if oh charles manson is applying to work at this mcdonald's that takes a lot of courage i'm sure people won't mind (laughs) so in 2005 his parents died he was prevented from attending their funeral and he moved into public housing Issy Sagawa received benefits, uh, like welfare benefits for a time. He said in that interview that I previously mentioned with Vice Magazine that he mm-hmm. was being forced to make a living while being known as a murderer and a cannibal, and it was terrible punishment. Oh, but it wasn't terrible punishment to kill somebody for her? That wasn't terrible punishment for her? No, I would say like you got no punishment really that you should have received. But- Seriously, oh, you were held for two years after murdering someone and you've been free and your making your life and I, I don't know how the laws work in other countries but i i believe that in america you're not supposed to be able to, to profit off your crime that's if you're convicted if you're convicted so he also like he was never convicted so nope. he can still profit off it which is yep. just messed up exactly exactly in 2013 issy sagawa uh, had to go into the hospital from a cerebral brain uh, a cerebral brain infarction which permanently damaged his nervous system he currently lives alone and he needs daily assistance which is provided by his younger brother or from caregivers 
Uh, he claims at one point to have regretted his obsession, but he has also said that um, he would like to eat another person before he, he dies. He has even planned out how he would do it. Yeah, if I'm the brother, I'm real uncomfortable with that statement. Okay, well, I'm glad you said that because you had no idea I was about to tell you this. This is That's so funny. <laughs> In 2018, a French filmmaker was following Issy and his brother and, and, and recording stuff. And he got in a recording, Issy and his brother talking. And his brother says, as your brother, would you eat me? Issy's response was pure silence and an empty stare. Dude, can't even lie. Which means, yeah, brother, I would totally eat you. Well, yeah, and, and let's let's think about this. How many? So the guy says he's like to eat one more person for before he dies. He needs constant help. The one person who's around the most often. I mean, A plus B equals cannibal. Yeah. So Issy Sagawa, again, is currently still alive and has to have the assistance daily of his brother. So if we end up, you know hearing in the news that something has happened it's because this murderer has been out on a technicality for over 30 years Oof, that is technicalities are just infuriating legal loopholes you know, it's like it's not like the guy ever even said he didn't do it no nope. you know Mm-mm. like he has admitted it the whole time but they're like oh you were crazy so We'll just put you in this institution. Not even just admitted it, but written books on it. Oh, profited off of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you also got to wonder if it's like, oh, I can't write books about, it. well, you've written 20 books about the same thing, man. It's not the Bible. You can't just keep <laughs> redoing it. Like publishers are like, oh, give me a new story. Oh, the same story. Oh, okay. The 20 other book. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fun. Uh, you know, we're good. We're good. Uh, yeah. But there you go. That is the story of the murderer who was free on a technicality. And is still plotting to eat his brother to this day. Mm -hmm. Super creepy. Yeah. I would not want to be a caregiver alone with him because, I mean, we've talked about old people that murder. They seem all frail and stuff. I don't trust him. Oh, yeah. This guy's always been frail. Yeah, exactly. And, and like, just given this guy's history, he's already tried with his brother once and it didn't work. His brother just doesn't know it. It's, it's got to take the because second time. Every Everything, ta- it's two times. He's always mm-hmm. got to take two times. He's got a practice run. It's like the practice swing. You get up to the tee. Like you, okay, then, then, then you swing and you miss. You're like, oh, that was a practice one too. <laughs> We're still practicing. We're still practicing. Still practicing. It doesn't count. Don't write that down. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. That's the B side. You know, if I was his brother, I'd want a fam- film crew around all the time too. Yeah, seriously. Just be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, camera just, or something. Yeah, you just uh, have a film crew around at all times just to make sure he doesn't try anything. Mm-hmm. Great. Ugh. All right. Well, for the A side today, we are going in entirely different direction. Uh, there are uh, no cannibals in, no. involved in, in this one. I know, shocking. Um, we had talked about kind of uh, some of the things we've watched this week. And uh, one, I didn't get to watch as much because I was actually getting out and doing things uh, this weekend, which was really exciting. And I was able to go to a convention that a friend of mine was performing music at, but it was a very unique convention to me. I had never gone to one. It was a video game music convention. So the entire convention is based on uh, DJs and artists remixing music from video games into original pieces and then playing them in sort of like a concert set. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was also like, you know, there was like a show floor with like board games and stuff. It was, you know, very fun, nerdy, uh, but it was an entire genre of music that I previously had not really given much thought to. It was only going because my friend w- was performing and it was a lot of fun. Uh, it is great that live events are back. Mm-hmm. I got to sit down and play like random uh, card games with complete strangers and uh, I got to listen to a ton of music. And I guess one thing I didn't realize or had never thought about a lot of music from video games is not copyrighted because it's not sold just for the music unless it's put on a soundtrack or something you're put into a movie mm-hmm. they don't copyright it so a lot of the video game companies are totally cool with people using their music and remixing it and putting it on youtube and creating mixes on spotify uh, and it's sort of allowed within the industry and expected which feels very different i mean 
in the radio, we know like there's only so many bars of something you can sing or even play without having to like end up somebody getting paid. Right. So it's, it's a very different feel. And so listening to all this video game music and having a great time, uh, I was thinking about how video games have come into other arenas of media over time and how they've been accepted. And I was thinking back to what in my mind was considered this huge failure from the early 90s. And it was the first video game that was, well, it was one of the first video games. I think the, there were a few earlier that were made into to animated movies, but his first real live action, big budget, 1993, going to be a blockbuster movie. And it was Super Mario Brothers, which starred Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo as Mario and Luigi. Mm-hmm. It had Dennis Hopper as the ruthless President uh, Koopa, who was the sort of dinosaur guy in the games, it's Bowser. They took a, a few licenses with characters and the story. And that's what, at the time, everybody was upset with. I remember being a kid who wasn't allowed to play those types of video games because I was only allowed to play video games on the computer, which in hindsight is a very thin difference, but I couldn't play Nintendo because we didn't have a Nintendo at home. So I could only play Nintendo when I visited my friend's house. And my friends were super into Mario Brothers and Super Mario Brothers. And this was a big deal that this movie was coming out. And it's the early 90s. And we're thinking it's going to be something epic, like on the level of Batman or Batman Returns, or, you know, even some of the, the Superman movies from the 80s. And it came out and it was completely different than what we everyone expected. It was not as cartoonish. It didn't seem to follow, well, the problem is there's no story in the early Mario Brothers games. It's just these two plumbers who got to go save a princess. That's the entire story. It's never stopped Hollywood before, uh, but they had to come up with something new. And I always thought, well, this was Hollywood, you know, taking something too far and trying to do too much with it. And that's why it didn't work because they didn't honor the source material. It's like, you know, making pride and prejudice and zombies, you know, it's like, why would you do that? Why would you just throw in zombies? Oh, wait, Hollywood did that already. It's already a book. Uh, why just add random stuff to it? But as I dove into it, because I got home on Saturday night and the music from the convention is still bouncing around in my head. And I was like full on, like proud dad, big brother mode. So I took 400 pictures during this like 90 minute set of my friends. I was just like, it was like full dad in white sneakers and khakis in the back, just like clicking just like pictures, 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 nonstop. Had a great time. And so I was like, hey, I was thinking about Mario. I was like, can I, can I watch this? I haven't seen this in forever. I wonder if they used any of the music from it. Like, you know, did they use the game music in the movie? I can't remember that, so I'm going to check it out. And what I learned is that you cannot stream Super Mario Brothers in, on any platform at this time. You can only oh, wow. buy it via DVD. Uh, I heard, I read rumors that the... Netflix eat like mail disc to your home service is still a thing in some places. Yes, it is. But I guess they have it. You can you can try that, you know, version to get to, to get a version of Super Mario Brothers. However, you can also find uh a lot of versions of it online. And there's an entire remade version where somebody has gone through and found all the that they found an old cut of the movie that is 20 minutes longer on VHS and somehow got the rights to put it online and you could watch it online uh, and has like remastered it and expanded and shows where all the, the things are different. And because I couldn't watch it, I was like, well, I'm already going down the rabbit hole. I want to figure out as much about the movie as I can. And I got, went in with the understanding that this was Hollywood messing with a known quantity because they just didn't know what they were doing. And what I found out is that there are a lot of reports that Nintendo was actually cool with letting them go a different way. In fact, they were so they felt the characters of Mario and Luigi and the game itself had such power that nothing the movie could do would influence the brand. So they were like, well, let's see what Hollywood can do with these characters and use them in a different way. I feel like it's not like that life lock commercial. Uh, my company is so great that I'm going to give you my social security number yeah, and yeah, you'll never yeah. be able to hack me. And then they hack him. Yeah. Well, I mean, to, to Nintendo's credit, Mario Brothers, no, like the franchise playing games, 
like they've never stopped selling well and this movie didn't ruin it uh in fact it's more of a blip where people are like hey that's not mario brothers whatever we'll we'll walk away uh but in the early stages of the of nintendo allowing somebody to do a super mario brothers movie they really said hey like give us your ideas and there were a ton of really interesting ideas uh one of uh the first people that took a shot at it was the gentleman who had just uh done uh rain man uh, barry morrow wrote a a screenplay which was basically about mario and luigi on an existential road trip as brothers and learning about their relationship as brothers so oh. that people even called it like it was like rain man with the mario brothers mm-hmm. uh and they were like well it's you know a little bit a little bit too heavy probably a little bit too adult and somebody else came along and said this is like a serious drama piece with like two guys with mustaches that doesn't seem anything like a video game. Uh, then another production company came along and said, okay, we want to do something more like wizard of the Oz, where you've got the, the real world and you've got, you know, the, the, the game world. And somehow, you know, they get transported between the two using these warp uh, tubes and that sort of thing. And by the end uh, it was offered to uh, directors like Greg Beeman, who had just done license to drive, uh, but, he got it pulled once his movie Mama Dad Save the World came out and was horrible. Uh, Harold Ramis of Ghostbusters was attached at one point and he loved the video games, but later would say that it was one of his uh, best decisions not to make the movie because he didn't know how it would come off on the screen. Uh, by the end, they had two writers, Rocky Morton and Annabelle Jenkel, who came together with a script got that script in front of the stars. And one of their goals was to get Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins was fresh off of doing uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit Mm -hmm. and uh, Hook. And he was like, you know, I don't know if I really want to do yet another sort of kid-friendly movie uh, in a row. And so he kept saying no. They're like, but you, like, it's like, dude, you look like Mario. Just, you have put on a mustache and you're Mario. Like, we have to... compliment. (laughs) Right. But, like, nobody was saying, like, Bob, you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, they did try to get Arnold to play uh, King Koopa, at one, or uh, President Koopa, uh, at one point as well. They get a script that they get all the actors to sign off on. So Hoskins finally says yes. It's going to be more of a Ghostbusters meets Wizard of the Oz meets Mad Max sort of adventure film, not super kid-focused. They get them all signed on. They're on their way to North Carolina for filming in May of 1982. I'm sorry, 1992. And by the time all of the actors get there, there's suddenly a new set of writers that the studio has brought in. And he's changed the script that they all signed on of. Like they said, oh, I want to do this script. By the time they start filming, it's an entirely different script. So people almost backed out. The directors wanted to leave, but they said, oh, we we can pull this together. And it turned into a very interesting movie that really probably would have been a better movie without the connection to Super Mario Brothers. Mm-hmm. Much like we talked about a, like uh, probably like 10 episodes ago with the um, Jeremy Renner Bourne movie. Right. It would have been a better spy movie if you didn't have the weight of the Bourne connection in it. And this was a fun, weird almost early 90s anti-fascist capitalist you know protest movie in ways of how the starts out with the and okay this is where we ruined a 30 year old movie Spoiler. so uh, get get ready uh, again if it's your first time with the a side b side podcast uh, what we do is we talk about cannibals angelina jolie and we ruin 30 year old movies <laughs> so at the beginning of the movie they set it up and there's probably in all the reviews I've read and it's been, you know, a long time since I watched it. I have not gotten my DVD copy yet. It is on its way. Uh, so I'll have to let you know how it feels, but I've watched the opening on various YouTubes. I've watched the extended edition that I was able to find online. Uh, it is a rough opening. It is a meteorite hits the earth to kill all the dinosaurs, except that meteorite actually creates two split dimensions and the dinosaurs are in one and the people are in the other. And they both evolve over time into humanoid like creatures. Okay. That is a lot to cover in 90 seconds. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then there's a princess whose mom brings the princess into the real world 
and leaves her here and this then gets killed by a random rock slide that seemingly comes out of nowhere because she's in a city uh, and that is the princess that the Mario brothers are going to have to rescue at some point. So they do a lot of exposition and a lot of story set up very quickly. It is very rough. But from that point on, it's really a fun story about two brothers working together to save a princess from some bad guys. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of subtle like moves like the Goombas are totally different in the movie than they are in the game. Uh, they are look like these giant guys in big suits with tiny shrunken heads. Uh, which is just a hilarious visual gaff or a visual uh, gag that always works for some reason. And I feel like it probably was one of the things that I really enjoyed as a you know 12 year old kid uh, that stands out. And then you've got these two characters, Spike and Iggy, which are played by Richard Edson and Fisher Stevens. And Fisher Stevens is one of my favorite like random character actors of my entire life he was he was the guy who played benny in short circuit as a white man who plays an an indian gentleman which would never be allowed again understandably i did not realize he was you know as just white and american as he is uh but they play these two thugs who almost have this rosencrantz and gildenstern sort of role where like they're kind of involved but not really but always show up to further the plot a little bit and in the movie at one point They go from being just the mindless thugs that are going to get the Mario brothers to understanding the oppression that their society is under because of President Koopa. Rapping in the extended version, they have a rap inside of a club where they're trying to convince people to rise up against Koopa. And then they get arrested and get brought, you know, sent to jail. They go, their characters have the most dynamic story through the entire movie. They're from complete thugs with no thoughts to being counter-revolutionaries and rappers to at the end, they're stuck in the real world when the two worlds are separated and people are talking about making video games about them. It is one of the stranger like subplots that I had completely forgotten about, but is much more prevalent in the extended version, which you can find online. And during our links, there's a a, a website that is apparently uh, seemingly legit that has the rights to put this out there. So uh, it's definitely worth a watch. They're a lot of fun. Uh, you've got Bob Hoskins and John Lugazamo who do a great job being Super Mario Brothers, but having to also seemingly be action heroes. And there is car cra- car chases and all these modded vehicles. And it's funny because the movie was made in May through July of 1992, Mario Kart, the ultimate Super Mario racing game, didn't come out until August of 1992. So the movie comes out in 93, and they're doing you know all these car chases that had never been part of Mario before, really, but now are because of Mario Kart. I don't know if there was any connection there at all, but in hindsight, it looks like they were like, oh, well, Mario Kart's coming, so we'll put car chases in the movie as well. But I have no idea if that made was actually part of the, uh, the understanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got great could be I mean it's a, it's a fun like 2020 hindsight thing uh, Samantha Mathis who was just sort of your early 90s it girl she was in a lot of stuff uh, at the time I was always conf- confused between Samantha Mathis and Bridget Fonda because they were both uh, redheaded ladies and I was you know 12 and could not you know I was very confused as who is who kind of how everybody is uh, confused about Jessica Chastain and uh, Bryce Dallas Howard right now yes because they kind of look alike and you're like wait mm-hmm. which, which oh, are they same person no different uh, and then of course Dennis Hopper playing President Koopa uh, which in the again hindsight very different clearly they were not predicting the future but there's some very similar vibes uh, for President Koopa as some of our recent elected officials, uh, which uh, granted it was you know 30 years before you know this person would be president, so clearly not uh, based on that. But it was an interesting sort of hindsight is 2020 connection to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, I highly recommend if you remember Super Mario Brothers and it just being this you know failure to live up to the source material. Once I found the information that Nintendo was like, hey, we want to see what you could do with these characters in the story and that they encouraged it and were interested in going a lot of different ways. To me, that made it feel entirely different when I watched the extended cuts and the, and the, and the clips that I could find online. And I'm sure it will make it very different when I finally get the DVD in the mail sometime next week. 
So as my voice is getting more and more scratchy because of the winter, uh, that is the ASI. All right. So are you, were you like addicted to the game though? Like, like no, really? no, like I, to me, it was this, it was this magical, mystical land that I could only visit when I went to other friends' house or like on birthday parties or that I saw on TV because we didn't have a Nintendo. I was not allowed to have a gaming console until I turned 18 uh, and until I graduated high school, really. When I graduated high school, the day after, like the week after I graduated high school, I took my graduation money and went out and bought a PlayStation uh, because I had graduated high school. So I was allowed to have a, uh, a gaming system for the first time. Now within five feet of me, there are six. So I think my parents were probably right to, uh, to, to, to make me hold off. Uh, but then again, maybe, maybe that's why I have so many now. That might be why I you didn't... have six now. Yeah, it's because I didn't have uh, the opportunity when I was a kid. So uh, I think it's amazing what they've done with the brand. And it's also interesting to know that there's a new animated movie that is coming out in the next couple of years that they've started casting and that sort of thing. So it'll be interesting to see. But Mario, or I'm sorry, Nintendo didn't allow any other movies of their licensed product from 1993 until 2018 or 2019 when Detective Pikachu came out. That was the next wow. live action version. So they, uh, I mean, they were like, hey, try something, but they don't do this willy nilly. This is not something like there's like, hey, I'll do it every time. They're like, there was a good 25 years in between the attempts or even more, 26, 28. I don't know. I'm bad at math. I'm supposed to have an agent by now. But it's, it's interesting to see that, that they waited that long before allowing Hollywood to take another crack at it, yeah. at least live action. Oh, well, there you go. That is the A side. That is the A side. My voice is getting even, even, even more sexy. Uh, All right. So, uh, Adam, you know the spiel? I do. Uh, so if you would like to support the podcast, which is great because you're already listening to it. So you've done the very best thing you can do. Uh, like and share uh, what you just listened to, whether that was on Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, uh, Apple Music, anywhere else. You maybe have got this on a, on a dodgy stream out of uh, some you know foreign country. Go for it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Listen to it anywhere. Uh, share it. Like our stuff. We're on all the social medias. Uh, that would be the Facebook, the Instagram, uh, we're not on LinkedIn currently. Actually, I am on LinkedIn if you want to find me, because that'd be weird. But you can search A-Side B-Side podcast on LinkedIn as well. Um, we always love to know your thoughts on our episodes. And also, if you know of any cannibals that are free that you'd like us to talk about, or bad movies from 30 years ago that I can ruin on the internet, let us know. <laughs> uh, if you have true crime stories that aren't don't involve cannibals, even better. That would be great. Uh, if you want to buy merch, you can go to a side b side podcast dot square dot site Boom. and pick up merch there. Uh, you could also, you know, if you're like, ah, there's so many options, just go to that site and all of our options for listening are there. And then you can subscribe and then your apps will tell you, oh, there's a new episode which come out every Friday. So we've been doing this for 87 episodes mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to do at least eight more, probably 87 more. Just eight more? Just, just a well, you know, you never know. Who, who, who knows what's gonna happen? Somebody, somebody's gonna get big time soon. So, somebody's gonna what? Somebody's gonna be big time soon. You're gonna be too busy. I thought you said big time soon, and I was like, why would you put that out there? Oh no, I mean, I mean, I, I know that like every day, there's, there's a chance that someone could sue me for something. So, oh no. <laughs> Uh, also, because Brooke has to edit all of this, and what you've heard has probably sounded really concise and well put together. Uh, Brooke makes that happen, but she can only do that through the power of coffee. So you can go to buy me a coffee uh, mm -hmm. and search A side B side. Mm -hmm. A side B side pod. Yep. Yeah. And then you can buy her a coffee. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to listen to like a four hour podcast uh, because we wouldn't be able to do any editing without the power of coffee and caffeine. So make sure you do that unless you want a four hour podcast. All right, Adam, you summed it up very nicely. Thank you, Adam. Absolutely. Thank you, Brooke. <laughs>